be acceptable to you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. We often speak here of the power of metaphor in our faith. And the passage that we just shared this morning that Mark read for us is a great illustration of that. The image of Jesus as the Good Shepherd is one of the most iconic images in Christianity. Immortalized in paintings and stained glass windows, found in the names of congregations and hospitals, the picture of Jesus as the nurturing, caring shepherd of a faithful and endangered flock has informed much of the way we understand our faith, especially in churches. In fact, the term pastor comes from the word pastoral, which finds its root in the word pasture, the place where shepherds keep watch over their flock. So in traditional church idiom, I am your pastor and you are my flock. And while I get where that phrase is coming from, I'm a little conflicted by that image. For the first century folks who heard John's gospel, however, this metaphor of a good shepherd was a powerful one. They were agrarian people, and flocks of sheep were common in ancient Palestine. In fact, in all probability, the population of sheep exceeded the human population. Yet despite how familiar this shepherd metaphor was, this description of Jesus was surprisingly scandalous for its time. Shepherds were not a highly respected group. It was a low skill profession conducted far away from polite society. Shepherds were known to be loners, often antisocial, rough, and uncivilized. Keeping company with sheep 24-7 might have had something to do with it. They were also hired hands, mercenary caregivers. They often had little invested in the actual care of the flock, other than a desire to keep the flock together so they could keep their job. What could John mean by referring to Jesus in this way? Well, of course, John is making a statement, a contrasting statement for sure, about the kind of shepherd Jesus is. He is a good shepherd, the one who knows his sheep, who cares for them, and is willing to lay down his life to protect them. A good shepherd is not a mercenary, but someone who is passionately committed to his role. A good shepherd guards the vulnerable sheep from the dangers that seek to prey on them. It's a profoundly comforting image. Yet in using this metaphor, John also implies that, like a shepherd, Jesus is an outsider, perhaps even an outcast, and is willing to live on the margins of society to do this important job. That he sees value in people and communities that others reject, and is willing to lay it all on the line to make sure that everyone is included in the flock. From that perspective, this metaphor speaks to me deeply. I understand how it relates to the person of Jesus that I have come to know in the gospel stories. But I'm less persuaded by the other obvious metaphor in the story. For if Jesus is the shepherd, then we are the sheep. And I don't really know how I feel about that. Now, being the 21st century suburban dweller that I am, I don't have a lot of firsthand experience with sheep. What opinion I do have was formed the year I spent in Ireland during college, when my daily walk to school took me right past a sheep farm. The shepherd often seemed to be driving his flock to, from one field to the next, just as I was heading to class. And we usually met in the middle of a narrow stone bridge. These morning traffic jams taught me a thing or two about sheep. As Maddie alluded to, first of all, sheep are bigger than you would think, and dirtier, and smellier, and noisier, and let's face it, fairly stupid. And they are not nearly as cute close up as they are from a distance. They are not self-starters, problem solvers, or independent thinkers. Their main skill seems to lie in blindly following their leader. So applying this metaphor to us as the faithful flock, I find it rather offensive. It's one thing to recognize the noble qualities of the good shepherd in Jesus. It's another thing to see us as sheep. Of all the ways I would describe the members and friends of this congregation, blind followers is not one of them. Nor would I say noisy or smelly or stupid. 
And let me just say, you certainly are as cute close up as you are from a distance. And likewise, I do not consider myself your caretaker, your pastor, in the way that a shepherd is. I do not believe that I am the only one who can lead you to green pastures or set you on the right path or make sure you are fed. In fact, as a congregational minister, I see my role as equipping all of you to take on these roles for yourself. Our ministry is a shared ministry. We acknowledge the priesthood of all believers, which empowers us to participate in the care of the community, to be agents of healing and learning and grace for one another in the name of Christ. And today is a prime example. For this morning, as we gather here, a dozen of our members are serving the hungry and homeless in Irvington. And yesterday, one of our folks helped to build a house for a low-income family in Newark with Habitat for Humanity. And after we worship here, a group of us are heading to Broadway House to bring a service of communion and healing to the residents there who suffer from HIV and AIDS. We see this outreach as rooted in Jesus' call to take action to care for the least of these. Faith is not just a noun, it is a verb. And here in this church, we also explore that faith in new and challenging ways. We find grace in asking hard questions and allowing ourselves to be transformed in the process. We are not passive followers of the gospel. We are ministers of the gospel, each and every one of us. And that, and in that role, blind and uncritical and sheep-like obedience is not often an asset. But that's the thing about metaphors. You can only take them so far. So when they start to fall apart, when they no longer communicate, you can let them go. So for the purposes of this sermon, I am going to let go of the congregant as sheep metaphor. But I'd like to focus on another image that John presents to us. For in this passage, we not only hear of all the ways that the good shepherd protects us, we also hear that there are real dangers to our safety. John writes that there are thieves and bandits and wolves who seek to carry us off. Now, understanding that metaphors have power only when we can really relate to them, we might need to unpack this one a bit. The folks who would be the thieves and bandits and wolves in Jesus' and John's time will certainly be different than they are in our time. For John's community, living in an era of spiritual and political persecution and upheaval, those threats would have been rather finite and external. They might have been the agents of Rome, who tried to force the Christians to worship the emperor. They might have been the Jewish leaders who rejected those who tried to preach the gospels in the synagogue. They might have been the Gnostics who offered a different understanding of Jesus and threatened to undermine the fledgling faith. But that was then. This is now. If the gospel is to live, if it's to have meaning for us today, we must ask ourselves this question. Who are the wolves for us? Very often we hear Christians use insider and outsider language. For much of the history of the church, it's focused on threats, outside threats, to doctrinal purity, for example, emphasizing the rules and drawing the boundaries between heresy and orthodoxy. That was a wolf. Of course, this is not unique to Christianity, but I find this emphasis especially ironic, or dare I say hypocritical, when Jesus' message was one of such radical inclusion. The gospel stories constantly tell of Jesus' challenge to the narrow rules and regulations of the Pharisees. The most heated exchanges were often around questions of who was in and who was out, who was considered valuable in the eyes of God. Jesus drew a much wider circle than the Pharisees did. And in the beginning, Jesus' followers modeled their community on this countercultural notion of radical inclusivity. Welcoming the outcast and the stranger was a hallmark of following in the way of Jesus. But after Christianity became the religion of Rome, things changed. It took on a militancy and an aggressive stand against others. It saw wolves everywhere. Holy wars, an oxymoron if I've ever heard one, became a faithful response to a perceived threat and the idea that the faith had to be protected from outsiders became part of the theology. 
Even today, we find the church making accusations that there is a war on Christianity whenever secular arguments seem to threaten the force of religious doctrine in public life. Seen in this light, many modern Christian leaders find wolves lurking around every corner. In Islam, or feminism, or progressive politics, the powers that be on the religious right find wolves in Planned Parenthood, in the ACLU, in universal health care, and in radical nuns who care more about poverty than gay marriage. These are the threats to the modern faithful, they say. These are the forces that the Good Shepherd protects us from. Yet within this passage itself, there is a challenge to this narrow and exclusivist view. For just after Jesus explains that he will lay down his life for his flock, he tells us that that flock includes those who do not belong to this fold alone, and that he must bring them in also. He doesn't tell us we get to pick who's in the flock. That's his job, not ours. He knows them, and they know him. And knowing Jesus, the other folks he calls will surprise us. Just as it was radically shocking when Jesus ate with prostitutes and sinners and lepers and outcasts, breaking all the rules of his society, so too might we be scandalized by those who Jesus invites to be with him today. So what then are the forces that can threaten our faith journeys, that seek to undermine the teachings of Jesus today? I believe they are the very forces that threaten Jesus' radical inclusivity. I believe that our spiritual lives are in greatest danger when we lose Jesus' spirit of welcome and instead operate by fear. Fear of the other. Fear of losing our power. Fear of new ways of experiencing God in our lives. As soon as we begin creating communities of us and them, we are closing the gate to the pasture. We are deciding who is worthy of God's care. And in so doing, we weaken our connection to Jesus. One of the most insidious wolves lurking in our lives today is our self-centered culture. And I don't just mean individual selfishness, but societal, collective selfishness. The ways in which we so casually turn our back on those in need. Our national dialogue focuses way too much on how to improve our standard of living and not nearly enough on how our priorities diminish the quality of life for those we share the planet with. How can we remain faithful to the gospel that tells us to love our neighbors as ourselves when we exploit our neighbors or use more than our fair share of resources? How can we claim to be Christians and then put lower taxes ahead of caring for the poor and the sick? How can we call ourselves followers of Jesus when we are willing to sacrifice the health of our planet and the ability of future generations to breathe clean air and drink clean water for the short-term fix of lower gas prices? We may think that these are just political or environmental or economic issues and have nothing to do with our spiritual lives, but we would be wrong. Our church attendance or adherence to a creed or doctrinal purity or the fish on the back of our car doesn't make us Christians. Our love of each other does. If we are to develop a strong and meaningful relationship with Jesus, we must be willing to embrace the connection between our faith, our actions, and the life of the world. Our faith is not threatened by practices or beliefs or priorities of others but by our own self-interest and the neglect of our neighbors. It is threatened when we prize complacency over hard moral decisions, when we allow the fear of the other to force us to close the gate to those others that Jesus would welcome. If there is a threat to Christianity today, I don't believe it is found in secularism, but in a narrow version of the faith that attempts to silence God's voice at the margins the one that denies our interconnectedness, the interconnectedness of all creation, and reminds us that it is not all about us. When we decide we already know who God loves and who God doesn't, or when we enshrine Jesus in a stained glass image, we do not allow his radical, challenging, and often subversive message of love 
to take root in our lives in a way that can truly heal the suffering and the heartache in the world. As the Good Shepherd, Jesus does protect us from these forces that seek to destroy us. He is the source of our spiritual strength, and it is a comfort. Yet despite the passive implications of the flock metaphor, I don't believe that Jesus wants us to be complacent sheep. I believe he wants us to deepen our faith by opening the gate to all who wish to enter. I believe he wants us to recognize that we are our brother's and sister's keeper. Rather than look for wolves outside of ourselves, Jesus invites us to first exam examine the wolves within. There he will be to help us confront them and defeat them and inspire us to see the whole world as God's pasture. Amen.